Okay, I guess we can start. Uh, so the topic of this presentation is uh, how are we speeding up uh, software like PS and top, and uh, how we, it's a long, very long story how we came across this and what we're doing. And uh, this is, oh, anyone in the audience seen that the PS is slow? Uh, so, me personally, I had complaints like, PS is not working. And then I logged into the system and took a look around it under s -trace and I saw that it is working, just just slowly getting through all the files in slash proc. And uh, yeah, but from the perspective of the user, it was not working because it, it gathers all the information first and then it sorts it and so on. Uh, and there is no output for quite a long time, uh, and it does that. Uh, so the agenda here is I give you a short introduction about the company I work for, the projects that I'm involved with, and, and me myself too. Uh, then we'll see what is the current uh, interface of accessing the information about the processes and uh, its limitations. And um, then I'll show a similar problem actually one problem uh, that uh, was solved before. And then I present the solutions, uh, both bad and good, and uh, we'll see the what is the performance of the good solution we are coming up with. Uh, so uh, marketing forced me to put this slide. Uh, I work for Virtuosa. This is the company who's been around for a long time, and we are an industry pioneer. Uh, we did containers before it was cool, before they were called containers, and uh, we have lots of partners and lots of workloads running. Uh, some of these guys, I believe, they are actually present here at this conference, our partners. And uh, so the company was founded actually back in 97, and uh, we are in the process of uh, uh, separating from the parent company and uh, we have the headquarters is in Seattle, we have offices in London, Moscow, Munich and uh, it's about 170 employees, uh, more than 100 of those are actual engineers and we have the 15 kernel hackers on board, not that kernel hackers are not engineers, uh, they're actually like the best engineers. Uh, and we are sponsoring some of the key open source initiatives or sponsoring or contributing or otherwise involved in this. Uh, so virtual is the same company as used to be known as SWSoft and Parallels and Odin. Uh, it's the very same company, just that sequence of names. Uh, uh, me, myself, uh, this is the first time I'm inserting the slide about myself, uh, actually. Uh, a Linux user since 95, I was, back in the day, was Slackware, very old kernels, very funny hardware and software. And I w I'm involved in development of containers since about 2002. Uh, actually, they were called virtual environments. Uh, as opposed to virtual machines, and uh, the term container came a bit later. And I'm the principal author of uh, utilities such as VZ CTL and VZ package. The last one, I believe, is sort of the precursor for Docker. Uh, and then I was leading the OpenVZ, the whole OpenVZ project from its very beginning in 2005 uh, up to up to last year, and I moved on and I'm into doing some of the research stuff. I also happen to be the long time scale speaker. My first time here was exactly 10 years ago. I was uh, doing an introductory talk about OpenVZ and that was actually my first talk and that was actually my first uh, time in US because I was living in Russia at the time. Uh, any anyone here that attended Scale 4X? Yeah, wow. So th 
there's two of you, two of us. <laughs> all right. Uh, so my Twitter account is my family name, Kolishkin. Uh, and that's all about me, I guess. So the OpenVZ is the full uh, container solutions for Linux. Uh, unlike Docker, we do full container system container. We run the whole distro inside the, each of the container. Uh, it looks more like a VM, but, but it's a container. And uh, it's been developed since the last century, and it was open source in 05. And that's how OpenVZ project was born. And we have the live migration for containers since 2007. And one of the goals of the project at the time, and it still is, was uh, that back in the day there were no container functionality in the kernel at all, so we had to patch the kernel heavily, a lot. And then we found ourselves out with lots of kernel patches, and uh, we felt that we'd better merge those patches into the upstream Linux to make everyone else use it and to ease our work of porting over the newer kernel. So it ended up being that we have uh, submitted over, not submitted, but merged uh, over 2,000 uh, kernel patches to, to the Linux kernel and uh, that makes us biggest contributor to the container functionality in the kernel and uh, that is the stuff that enables uh, Alexi, Docker, CoreOS, and, and of course OpenVZ too. Uh, so OpenVZ is now being reborn in the form of Virtuals of 7, and uh, it's becoming yet more open, less, I, I think, less proprietary components, more open. So Virtuals of 7 is currently in beta, and uh, you're all uh, welcome to give it a try. I think that the beta three is about to be released. Uh, so Creo is another project I'm involved with and this talk is mostly about some small work that we've done with Creo. Uh, so Creo was born as a sub-project of OpenVZ uh, in order to replace OpenVZ in kernel checkpoint restore mechanism and uh, I'll tell about it later. It's bit older than three years old, and uh, the whole point of Creo is to be able to save and restore sets of running processes, the processes running on the Linux system. So you can, uh, it's like the sort of hibernation suspend to disk for your notebook, but not for the whole system, for the just set of the processes. That set of the process might accidentally be a container. Uh, so this is what Creo does. It saves the complete state of the running system and later you can restore it. And then you can restore it on a different machine and it's called live migration. Uh, uh, Creo is currently integrated into OpenVZ of course and Docker and LXC and if some of you guys have seen the Docker demo where they play Quake and they migrate the Quake server from like Europe to US this is all done with Creo. Uh, being able to checkpoint and restore sets of running processes is a prerequisite for live migration, but uh, the focus of Creo is a bit wider than that. For example, you can do things like uh, saving a period periodical state of the very long running computational process, HPC. Like you have something that needs two weeks to be calculated and you have that running and there's a power failure in between and you lose a week of your work. So uh, instead of modifying the application, you can use Creo to periodically checkpoint its state and like say once, once uh, every hour and uh, in case something goes wrong, you can use the checkpoint and uh, r restore it from that state. Uh, instead of losing one week of work. Uh, same thing for games. You can have that magical save button in, in a game that lacks it. Uh, you can do things like updating the kernel or doing something with the hardware that requires a reboot or power off. Uh, so instead of stopping everything, you checkpoint everything and then you do your stuff like rebooting to a new kernel and then you 
restore. Instead of starting everything up, you restore it. it that way it's faster, and uh, if you do it within a few minutes, uh, all the network connections will remain, and uh, so your users will see it as not as a downtime, but it's some sort of the unusual long delay. Uh, using live migration, of course, you can do load balancing between nodes in a cluster. Uh, you can speed up application startup. For example, we did the test with Eclipse GUI uh, that took about a minute and a half to start, and then we checkpointed it. And when instead of start, we restore it, and it takes like five seconds instead of a minute. So I believe some companies are trying to do with with Android phones. Uh, uh, you do things like reverse debugging, like going back in time, so you have the checkpoint and then you can always return to that checkpoint and test from that, not from the very beginning of the application. And also due to a feature of one feature that we have in Creo and uh, what we use in Creo, you can inject faults into the application. So for example, you can close the open file descriptor of any application and see that it handles that correctly, for example, uh, stuff like that. So the main ideas behind Creo is basically we had the task of merging all the OpenVZ kernel stuff into the upstream Linux, and one part of it, I think it was like about one third of the code was checkpoint restore for, for containers. And uh, we tried hard merging it, uh, but the code is in the kernel, it's across all the kernel except maybe for drivers. It's very invasive and no single subsystem maintainer wanted to see our code in their beloved subsystem. So, uh, and we were not the only one who tried to implement checkpoint and restore in, in the Linux kernel and merge it upstream. There was a guy who spent a few lives of his, a few years of his life in order to try to do the same, and he failed as miserably as we did. And so we decided to hack around it and re-implement the whole thing in user space, or mostly in user space. Uh, so this is how Cree was born. Uh, the idea is, for checkpoint, you need the state of the applications running. And there are a lot of existing mechanisms to gather that state, to get that state from the kernel. So there's the whole flash proc with various bits and pieces of information about the processes running. There's the ptrace mechanisms used by debugging. And there's the netlink socket, which you can use to get the information about networking. And then there is an interesting feature uh, called Parasite Code Injection that lets you insert your own code into a running process and run it as, as if you were that process. Some bits of information about the process, you can only get it being that process. So this is why we have that Parasite Code Injection and this is how we use it in Creo. Uh, of course, not all the information is there and uh, when it's not, we have to amend the kernel, we have to add some functionality to the kernel to provide this more information that we need in order to get the complete picture of what's running. And uh, so far we have achieved it with all about 170 kernel patches, which is pretty small, I guess. And as of kernel 3.11, uh, this kernel is sufficient to run Crew. Uh, it has everything, like 99% of it. Uh, there, there are some corner cases that we attacked uh, later, and there might be some more patches from Crew project coming into the kernel, but it, most of it is in kernel 3.11. If config checkpoint restore option is set. So the config checkpoint restore option, uh, it appears because upstream kernel developers were not quite convinced that it's possible to do checkpoint restore in user space, but they let us try it, and they said like, okay, everything you put in there should be under this define, and uh, 
If you fail, we just remove all this code together with all the defines. Uh, fortunately, we succeeded. Uh, and most of the distros are set this by default now. So, uh, to the topic of the talk. Uh, the current interface of getting the information about the processes is mostly the proc PID interface where you can have a directory for each process you have a directory and its name is the process ID and in that directory you have about 40 different files uh, telling some information about the process uh, and there are some like I don't know about 10 directories and some more stuff on there so it's more than 45 maybe I don't know 60 70 uh, and this thing is there since the very beginning, I believe. Uh, and it's working for everyone, but it has some limitations. And those limitations are, first of all, as we found out by uh, profiling crew, we found out that it takes a lot of time uh, doing reading the proc. And it's because for every small file in there, you need at least three system calls. You need open, read, and close. And then you repeat ad infinitum uh, because there are so many files and then there are so many processes. And this is the same thing that PS is doing. Uh, it's a lot of uh, context switches. That's a lot of syscalls. The next problem is that those files and procs um, pretty much every file has its own unique format. And uh, some files are uh, presented like tables with a header. Some files are like tables without a header. Some files are just this sequence of numbers and strings. Some files are like name, column, value, and stuff like that. And uh, basically, you have to write your own parser for each of those files. And this is what we are doing. Uh, slightly less problem is that the format is text-based and basically the kernel has it all in binary form and then it prints it out for us in text form. Then we translate this back into binary, for example, when reading numbers and reading UIDs and stuff like that and then we translate it back to text for printing. That's a lot of translation back and forth. Uh, ideally, we, we would get just the binary stuff right from the kernel. Uh, but the upside is it lets you read the files from proc using just cat and, and see what's going on. Uh, third problem is uh, there's not enough information in there. Uh, uh, for example, if you take the prod FD, uh, it shows you the file descriptors <coughs> opened and the files that they are associated with, like you see that zero is def in and so on. Uh, the, the problem there is due to overmounts, those file names can be irrelevant. Uh, then there is no way to figure out what the what the position in the file is and what are the file open flags are and so on. For that, we, we solved it by adding proc pid fd info in, in there for every file descriptor you have that additional information. But there is much more to it. It's just one example of kernel not providing enough information. Uh, very big problem is some of these formats of the proc files are not extendable. So this is the example. So these are the mappings of the current processes, the mm, regions of memory that are mapped it has the addresses, the protection bits, some other information, the major minor numbers, and the file name. Like this is the library that is mapped into the cat process. 
the problem is this last field, the file name, is optional because there are anonymous mappings. And uh, that means if it's optional, that means you cannot add any more information after it. This is the last field. Now, we need VM flags in here. And, and we can't add it because, yeah, this is basically set in stone. You cannot change it without ruining all the backward compatibility. Fortunately, we do have uh, VM flags in a different files called SMAPs. So these files, not maps, but SMAPs, has the information that we need, these uh, VM flags. Unfortunately, this also has these statistics. Oops. This, this statistics, like how mem much memory is used, is also available from that file, but we don't need it. Well, we discard it. The problem here is it takes a lot of time to gather this information, which we immediately discard. So this is the next problem. Sometimes files are proc in PROC are slow because of things like this. Let me show you an example here. So let's cat all the proc maps file. Re read them all. That's pretty fast. 0 0.02 seconds. Zero. How many copies? Uh, not much. Uh, I guess around 200 or something. Ooh. Yeah, 200. Uh, so the problem here, uh, that let's do the same with SMAPs. You see, it's one-tenth of a second, maybe even more. That's like, I don't know, five times slower than that. And it's just about 200 process. Imagine a system running thousands of containers you all have that, and it would be way over a second to read it. And this is for information that it's okay if we need this information. It's not okay if we immediately discard that information. First we ask the kernel to give it, and then we discard it. So the problem is sometimes files and proc are slow about because of those extra attributes that, are not all, that we are not always needing. Uh, so this is the same explanation that I just showed to you. Uh, and we had a similar problem when in crew when dealing with sockets and dealing with networking. Usual st stuff to get information about sockets are in ProcNet. There's a ProcNet Netlink, ProcNet Unix, TCP, and packet socket. And uh, of course, each of those four files have their own unique format. They, some of them try to look like tables, some of them try to look like lists. Uh, there's tons of fields, so they all look ugly, but still human readable. Uh, now, it's a basically the set, same set of pro problems that, uh, as I just described. Uh, there might be not enough information in there. The format is complex, and uh, it's all or nothing approach. You either request every information or no information at all. Uh, fortunately, there is a solution already in the kernel, the so-called Netlink socket that it is used, uh, was used to get the information about TCP sockets, and it was called TCP Diag. Uh, at some point, I think it was called INET Diag because it was, has been renamed. So we generalized it and added all the other types of sockets into there, and now it's, it is known as SOC Diag, and uh, we don't need these proc files anymore. We just uh, ask the kernel what we need through that Netlink socket. Uh, there are two 
very good things about Netlink socket. First of all, the format is binary and extendable. It is designed that way. You can just add some new fields without ruining backward compatibility. And second is you can specify explicitly what kind of and for and about what do you need from the kernel. You don't get all or nothing. You don't get extra bits that you are throwing away. Just what you need. So we looked at that and thought, why don't we add tasks to the same interface? And that was a bad solution to the problem. So basically we extended the netting socket with thing called task diag and uh, we ask information about some processes through a netlink socket. We we know we, we want to know this and this about this set of processes. And it gave us back. The problems are first problem is Netlink socket is actually designed around network, and it knows everything about network namespaces, but it doesn't know anything about process ID namespace or user namespace or other namespaces, and it's not clear how to amend it with all this. You need to extend the format or other way, do something like that. And it's not, probably not a good thing because it's a Netlink socket, it's about network. Uh, the other problem is Netlink sockets uh, has some sort of the weird security mechanism. Uh, when we create a socket, it, the kernel uh, save the credentials and later use those credentials to figure out are we allowed to do this and that or not. Uh, but the process later can drop privileges like you can start as root, open the socket, and then drop the root. Uh, but it still it is irrelevant to the netting. Uh, it saved those credentials, and it will still think we are root. And finally, it's one interface, and it is used to get and set information about networking. And we, when we use the same interface to get process attributes, we can potentially abuse it to, for example, add IP addresses to the, to the interfaces. Uh, there is no mechanism to you know, restrict us from doing that. And uh, this is why that makes it bad for, makes Netlink, back, uh, Netlink uh, bad for solving our task with PROC. Uh, there is yet another example of using Netlink, abusing Netlink for the bad thing, and it's called task stats. It's basically statistics about running tasks. It's not available from PROC, but it's available, available through the Netlink socket. And this, uh, I think, needs to go away, but, but it's still there. And we don't want to add yet another bad thing to the kernel. Instead, we are proposing this interface a file called proc-task-diag. Proc um, it's a transaction file, so you write a request to it and you read a response back to it. If there are two users, uh, every, every user will get its own reply. Uh, it uses the same good Netlink message format. It's binary and extendable, and it's good because of these two characteristics. Uh, it lets you get information about the specified set of processes, more, more on, on this later. And uh, we made sure that we group the attributes. Uh, attribute is some, some value like, for example, PID or U, UID or program name or something like that. Uh, and we group those attributes into groups, and the netlink only lets you get some information about the group. So you specify, I want this group, and this group, and this group, and it gives you all the attributes in this group. The thing is, if you add an attribute to the group, which makes it slower, you are doing it wrong. You need to separate this into special group. So everything that slows us down should go into separate group. So we adhere to that principle. 
finally, uh, Netlink uh, socket messages are limited to 16 kilobytes, but you can have many packets. So whatever, if, if, if there are more than 16 kilobytes, it's just that the kernel splits that for you. Uh, and this is what we have right now, and we think it solves the problem that we came across. Uh, and it also solves the problem of slow PS and some more. Uh, but this is work in progress. The current status is we are about to send the patches to the kernel. Uh, we already sent a uh, few iterations of the patches using the Netlink socket, the bad solution. Uh, we have discussed it. We understood that it's a bad approach and we're going, slowly going with this one. We are about to send the patches to the kernel. So it's not yet there. And because of it, it might change, so it's a work in progress. Uh, on this slide, I'm not sure I really want to show it. It describes the format of the Netlink message. Basically, it says that it's easy to add any attributes, it's easy to add new groups. The format is completely extendable, and it's binary, and it's pretty simple. It's very easy to parse from A to C. Uh, so, what are the ways in our new proposed interface, what are the ways to specify what processes do you want to get information about? First of all, you can use uh, task diag dump all, get all the processes in the system. That's what PS would use by default, for example, or top. Uh, then you can do dump all thread, which means all the processes plus all the thread. So the distinction is, uh, is all the processes mean all the thread group leaders, all the threads mean all the other threads as well. Uh, you can ask it to dump uh, children of a specified PAD, like that would probably want some of the process like Apache would use, like get me all my children. Uh, you can, or, or crew use, would use that like get me all the processes in this container starting from its init. Uh, uh, then you can ask uh, for dumping all the threads of a specific PID that doesn't include children, that only includes threads. Uh, finally, just one process, just one specific process. I want to get information about this one. And uh, here are the groups of attributes, basically what you can ask for a uh, base group that includes all, all the different IDs and the common name that that is sort of same as PROC PID status. Uh, then you can ask for credentials, all, all the primary and secondary UIDs and GITs and the, creden and the capabilities. Uh, then you can add, ask for stats about the processes this is the same as task stats that I mentioned as another example of bad usage of Netlink socket. And this information is not available in PROC, and we very much hope that task stats would be replaced by this. Uh, then VMA, task diag VMA, which is a synonym of PROC uh, PID maps, and the VMA stat all those extra information that takes a long together and that we don't need, but someone might. Uh, performance comparison. Uh, for that, I have a VM running with this very kernel, with these patches that we are going to send. It's 4.4.0 plus our patches. And let me see what we have here. Not too much. So let's fork 10,000 processes. See, the PS is already slow. So what I'm about to do now is time proc all a So this task proc all 
is just uh, opening proc pip status and reading it and closing it. It doesn't even parse parses it. Uh, huh? Uh, there, I think there is no output. It's just uh, uh, yeah. It just outputs the total number of entries that it read. Uh, so you can see it's about 0 0.05 seconds. This is the current interface, the proc. So let's do the same thing with Diag. This using the new interface. So it's at least five times faster getting the same information. And uh, parsing is also easier, although I don't think it takes much of the time. Because instead of 30,000 system calls, we do just, just a few. Uh, so this is it, at least five times faster. This is the new proposed interface. Uh, one another performance metric I'm going to show you is comes from Perf project. These guys are who are writing the Perf tool. They uh, had similar problems about proc, and when they found out that we are doing something about it, they asked to share the patches and they tested it and this is an email from Dave Ern uh, who did some testing and in his testing the first test is like five, six times faster and the second test is like ten times faster. So this is what he found. I, I can say like independent performance testing. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, as I said, the current status is we are about to send this to the upstream, and it's not the first iteration, it's actually the third iteration, because the first two were netlink based. And uh, this is just a little bit of work that we are doing with Creo. It's much more of that. I think I can do like a week of talking about such things. Uh, but, oh, this is the last slide. Oh. Okay, I wanted to give you a, a link to the current code. And, uh, and I don't have a slide for that anymore, but Generally, Creo is available from creo.org. OpenVZ is available from openvz.org. And this work is in my colleague's uh, GitHub account. This it's github com a vegan linux test diag but you will see it on a linux kernel mailing list pretty soon that concludes my talk if there are any questions i'll be more than happy to answer and i think i do have some crew and open vz stickers if your notebooks can accommodate one or two more okay. thank you Question time. Is it also clear? Any uh, generic questions about OpenVZ or Creo or containers? Yes. I'm just curious if I knew that how all the concatenation works. So now what happens? Line is up to prove it or something? Uh, so basically, it doesn't go to Linus Torvalds himself. Usually, this stuff is not even discussed on the Linux kernel mailing list, but on, on some of the subsystem mailing lists. Although uh, this might be a subject for memory management list, but th there's no proc mailing list, so this, this was actually uh, stuff for the generic Linux 
uh, Linux kernel list. But usually it is discussed on the subsystem mailing list first, then every subsystem maintainer has his own tree, like there's the Linux SCSI tree or Linux uh, net tree with the maintainers. It is discussed, uh, it is agreed upon, it gets reiterated over and over, you polish your stuff, and uh, they're pretty sensible as it comes for APIs, and once it's all agreed upon and polished, it gets merged to the maintainer tree. And for the trees that don't have any maintainer, that goes to Andrew Morton, that has his own tree, like maintains everything that's not maintained. And these guys, the big guys, the subsystem maintainers, the lead tenants in other way, uh, they send the stuff to Linus. And Linus very rarely complains about it. It complains that it gets right before the merge window, or otherwise he just trusts the maintainers. And this uh, like tree of trust is there, uh, otherwise Linus would just die, you know, under the pressure of patches. Yeah. Which No, no, there's no upstream kernel yet, because uh, we, we are about to send it. So we, we send this stuff with a Netlink socket, and uh, we decided at the end, we decided that it's a bad approach. And this is a good approach. We just need to, you know, uh, split the patches, provide the nice uh, readme and so on. And we already have tests for that, and we already have other people, like from Perf team, who are about to support us with this. And uh, overall, I think that maybe not in its current form, but it will make way into a Linux kernel in this year, I yeah, think. Maybe later this year. Yeah, yeah, but so it will be like four point, I don't know. Point yeah, something like that, yeah, yeah. All right. All right, thank you so much.